the single best proof that history exists is just the flow of people around the world. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to get out of these poor, underdeveloped countries and go to Los Angeles or London or you know, some developed uh, uh, part of the world because they essentially want to skip over all this you know, historical development that, that they've been denied in a certain sense. If uh, the driving force of history from Hegel's point of view was, the in, in a way, the individual search for dignity or his mm -hmm. quest for recognition, um, in your recent books you, are more, you seem uh, less interested in that, although it's certainly still mm -hmm. present, but in the, you're more interested in the social nature of man, his kinship structures, the way his social nature has evolved over uh, time, and his... Uh, and it, the way in which his spiritedness mm -hmm. uh, can be um, captured by things other than dignity, it can be captured by love of one's own and preference for one's own people or one's own mm -hmm. ethnic group or, mm -hmm. or whatever. So do you have, uh, is history running as it were on two tracks? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's the, in, there's the individual and his destiny mm -hmm. with dignity in mind. And then there's also political man or social yes. man who's doing something else. Well, I don't know that those are separate tracks. I mean, Hegel said that the big driver of politics was recognition, the desire for recognition of one's dignity. Uh, and he argued that you know, the modern solution uh, was the only rational one where dignity is based on my individual worth, which is universal and, and shared by all human beings. But you can be recognized for a lot of other things. You can be recognized as a member of an ethnic group or a religious a sect. Uh, and if you look around the world today, a lot of the conflict are recognition, like mm -hmm. the stuff that's going on in the Middle East right now. Uh, I don't think it's actually being driven in many cases by actual piety. It's being driven by the demand, you know, that I come from a, a, a religion that has been uh, humiliated and I want to show that, you know, my beliefs are, are equal, if not superior. Uh, to yours, and I think that's what's driving a lot of the fanaticism. The same thing with nas nationalism, which mm -hmm. still remains a very powerful force in many parts of the world, where what I want is not my dignity as an individual recognized, it's my dignity as a Ukrainian or a Russian or uh, whatever. And so that transition from these uh, kind of partial uh, forms of dignity to a universal form is still, you know, so Hegel understood that this was the only rational form of mm -hmm. recognition. Mm -hmm. But that transition is a very difficult one uh, to make in many uh, societies. You, you, uh, one of the peculiarities of your earlier treatment was you didn't really talk much about the state, mm -hmm. although the state is, a, is the culmination of, of history in Hegel's account, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, der Staat, mm -hmm. um, a, a, a Rechstaat with rights and laws mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, individual dignity. Um, it interests me. The, in a certain way, you, one could say you could you almost have moved from political philosophy to social science, or from Hegel to Weber, <laughs> uh, from your earlier work to mm -hmm. to this work. Uh, do you, does that sound correct, or have yeah. you consciously changed your your weighting between political philosophy and and social science? Uh, I'm not sure. You know, I, uh, it, it, it partly has to do with my own self-education uh, because I started my uh, academic career reading a lot of political philosophy, mm -hmm. uh, but this kind of classics of, of social theory, you know, Adam Smith, Max Weber, Durkheim, all of yeah. these people I had really not been very familiar with. Uh, but part of it also just stemmed from a practical orientation, so I spent a lot of time in developing countries looking at problems of development where I think the social reality is really what defines the possibility for political institutions. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, most of the great works of social theory were written in the 19th century when Europe was making this big transition from an agrarian to a modern industrial society. And that's the same story that's playing out in China or in parts of Africa and so forth. So it just seemed to me that there was a social story that was 
you know, critical to understanding uh, how political institutions function. But the, the, the gap between that and the theory that I learned uh, earlier is, is, you know, in many ways not that great because Plato, you know, in Book Five of the Republic, the big problem is the family in mm -hmm. a certain sense. The mm -hmm. kinship is, uh, is a kind of bedrock form of sociability and yes. you can't have political community if people respect their families more than the, you know, than the polis. And so I, I think there's, uh, you know, a way of bridging these, these worlds. Well, you have Montesquieu, you have uh, there yeah. are other theorists who do enter in interesting ways into these. And, and into Tocqueville, these you know, Tocqueville has always been probably one of my favorite philosophers because he's completely immersed in the social mm -hmm. dimensions. You know, when he talks about the art of association, that's a sub-political, you know, uh, part of American, you know, you could call it political culture in the United States that isn't really defined in the formal political system, but mm -hmm. nonetheless has a very powerful uh, influence on the nature of American democracy. Right. So if you, uh, if you gave up Hegel, mm -hmm. um, you would still have an, a, a, an interesting and, and sweeping edifice of analysis here, uh, but you, don't give, you haven't given him up and you won't give him up. So what is it that he brings that you don't find in Aristotle or Montesquieu or Samuel Huntington mm -hmm. or Max Weber. Well, I'm not committed to Hegel, but I do actually believe that there's such a thing as history. And again, this kind of comes from my experience in developing countries. Uh, if you don't believe that there's such a thing as modernization, you know, you should mm -hmm. go to Guatemala and spend a lot of time in a rural village there where there's no health care, very low life expectancy, people mm -hmm. don't have basic education. Uh, they're insecure because the war of all against all is basically, you know, ongoing. Uh, and I think that, you know, I, I, I like to say that the single, to me, the single best proof that history exists is just the flow of people around the world. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to get out of these poor, underdeveloped countries and go to Los Angeles or London or, you know, some developed uh, uh, part of the world because they essentially want to skip over all this, you know, historical development that, that they've been denied in a certain sense. And, mm -hmm. Almost nobody wants to go in the opposite direction. You know, very few Americans move to Guatemala to enjoy the drug gangs and, and, and so <laughs> forth. So, uh, you know, so I think that's the sense in which I believe that you know, Hegel was onto something, that there is a broader uh, process right. of societies uh, evolving. And you know, that's part of the political reality that we have to deal with. But presumably people wanted to flee from the provinces to Rome. Uh, in antiquity as well, because mm -hmm. that's where the action was, and the and that's where civilization mm -hmm. was. But you're talking, but you're talking really about something that's more fundamental than any one political empire. That's right, and I think um, there's also been different stages determined by by economics, basically. So mm -hmm. an industrial society is really different. You know, Rome never got beyond the level of being a large agrarian society, right. uh, but that's really different from Britain in the 19th century. That's certainly different right. from Singapore, you know, today. Sure. And, and so there, in a certain way, I mean, Weber's insight was partly the questions that he asked mm -hmm. about the origin of capitalism, mm -hmm. which for him meant somehow the origins of modernity, mm -hmm. in, at least in some very deep sense. Yes. And y you agree with that in part, but not completely. Well, I do agree. He got a, a, a number of things wrong, but I think the questions that he was asking were fundamental. So he basically stood Marx on his head. You know, Marx said everything is just economics and the ideas are just a superstructure mm -hmm. that the capitalists use to justify their exploitation. Mm -hmm. And Weber said, no, actually the, the, the ideas are, are fundamental uh, and that's what makes the, the capitalist world possible. And I think that's fundamentally right. I mm -hmm. think that if you didn't have this change in, you know, the nature of the individual and how people thought about individual choice as opposed to communal choice, you couldn't have had the modern world. Mm -hmm.